Hi, everyone. This is Dan O'Neill, the Executive Director of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Before we get to our third Sunday presentation, I would like to thank the following businesses for sponsoring today's lecture. They made a vital investment in our museum, and their support is why we are able to bring you this lecture series at no charge. This month, we're really excited to bring you Marissa Dobrik. She is a reference archivist at the Vermont State Archives. She is delighted to assist everyone doing historic research. She shares some of the many historic treasures available in the vaults of the Vermont State Archives. Hello. Thank you for this opportunity to share just some of the historical treasures that are in the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. My name is Marisa Dobrik. I'm one of the archivists at the State Archives, and I act mainly as a reference archivist. However, I also do outreach like I'm doing today, and I process archival records that are coming in to the reference and research. I'm excited to share some of these historical treasures with you. Uh, since this is a virtual visit, I will have contact information for me personally and the reference room for your research needs at the end. I appreciate and am willing to answer as many questions as we can. We are here to assist. I am going to start today with a little bit of information about the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. We nickname this Vasara, so you will probably hear me refer to it as that. Also, the meat of this presentation is the treasures from our archival vaults. And lastly, there'll be some contact information, how to follow us on Twitter, and just information for your reference needs or if you'd like to contact me personally. I very much wish I could give you a full tour of the State Archives. It's a pretty interesting building. Um, today, we are just sharing what it looks like. Um, this was in different times when you could see the reference room in a more busy capacity. The Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, or VISARA, is a division within the Secretary of State's office. We're located in Middlesex. It's very timely to be sharing this with you today because it's Sunshine Week, which is a week where we highlight and share the importance of government records and open and accessibility for those records. It's really great to have this. Usually we would do an in-person in-service or some other kind of discussion to share that excitement. So I'm happy we can at least do this. Um, we are home to record specialists across a wide variety of work um, related to the life cycle of records. Um, the life cycle sounds a little funny, but that really means that a record can go from the active use to temporary storage to either destruction or permanent retention in the state archives. The archives is one area of that sort of broad whole. We're also at Visara charged with administering the statewide records and information management program. There's a lot of abbreviations. We call that RIM. Um, in the winter, you can see what we look like up in that space of Vermont State Archives, all that snow. Um, we have been working in the building despite much of the state government has not been and has been working from home. Most of our work really requires being in the building. Um, our reference room is currently open to the public on a limited capacity, so for COVID precautions, wearing masks, um, and our staff continues to answer questions by email or telephone, and we're happy to provide copies of records, and we've sort of loosened some of our more restrictions for assisting researchers with their copy request needs. The archival files in our largest filing room can look something like this. And I always say they look like there's something from a movie. Or maybe if you're like me and watch like Raiders of the Lost Ark or The Librarians or Warehouse 13, you kind of see this and it's jaw dropping and it looks overwhelming. The truth is we know where everything is. Um, we're open to um, all of our, our records are cataloged and easy to find what a researcher needs. So it looks innocently complicated, but it really isn't. Our staff from the record center staff can pull a box from the, the holdings and catalog immediately. And it's fun to take a look at this space. I really miss people getting to see it. Um, in the past, we've done these tours where we've done sort of a spooky tour through the archives 
just because I mean any warehouse at night can be give you some atmosphere. Um, I once accidentally got locked in a record vault. That wasn't fun, and I wouldn't advise it. However, we have emergency capabilities, and I was um, eated out as soon as possible. So the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, just to give you a little bit of a background, used to be two different divisions. It was the State Archives and the Public Records Division called the SARA. We're a division, as I mentioned, within the Office of Secretary of State. We maintain a state archive, which is the historic records of long-term value, but also for more modern things, the VT retain our digital repository. That has things like the governor's records from Governor Shumlin. It also includes the most recent legislative sessions, audio records, and um, handouts. This, our RIM specialists administer statewide records and information management. And then we also have a state record center for offsite storage of agency records. We also handle certain statutory filings and certificates. This is just a quick overview of what Visara is. It's really important, I think, when we're sharing public records that we tell people we have a mission, we have a vision, and we have a goal. I'm not going to read every each of these, but the biggest is where public records are a corner, cornerstone of government transparency. It goes back to Sunshine Week. We need to share and make the sunshine known on what people have done in the past and what people continue to do. So having an informed people who recognize, as we recognize and manage the public assets is very important. So these records have to be authentic and reliable, and there have to be tools so that we can efficiently provide access to the records. Some of these things I think people find boring. You think this sounds boring, but boring and bureaucracy Still, it's really important that people know that these are available. A lot of people have no idea what they can access in their state archives. And that behind sort of these little tour facade, there is some incredible documents that are waiting for you. As I mentioned, VT Retain, if you're working from home and would be interested in looking at some of the records available um, that have been born digital, that is where you can go. Um, Access right now is the reference room. This is sort of the home base for people coming to visit us. There's security concerns about using records. I mean, if somebody has been to a library, there might be multiple versions of a single book. Unfortunately, an archival record is often it. We have one copy, and if something happens to it, well, that is lost. And you'll hear about what has happened when other places have lost their records before later. This is just a, a reference room. It's not exactly the most fancy, but this is where we assist people with their research. And all of the staff who work with reference very much enjoy the variety of questions that we get to help people um, puzzle out. This is just our landing page right now for reference. Um, we're open by appointment and it's Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and you can make an appointment by calling us and you'll see that number at the end. We also have um, just other things that are available. We have some people come in for authentication and um, getting access to their some vital records. This is a quick little view of our staff. Some of it is pictures that were taken before the pandemic and some of it is taken afterwards. Um, you can see me last year with a little more coiffed haircut pre-COVID-19. Um, I was giving a talk on historic court records in the Vermont State Archives. Um, Nancy Austin Bradley is in the upper left-hand corner. She is the primary um, contact with reference work up front. Um, we have a roving archivist program that is run by Rachel Onoff, and that is an exciting program where individual historical societies can get assistance um, for their historical research. She also does a lot of assistance with grant writing and is a good resource to be familiar with. Tanya Marshall's in the green mask. She is the state archivist and head of this division. You can see Sally Blanchard O'Brien uh, in the middle there doing some processing. Uh, she also assists Rachel Onoff, and then 
not every person who works here is viewable here. And I think I cut off poor Will at the very bottom, but all of our staff here are very happy to um, provide assistance as we can. People sometimes ask me, well, what is it that people are researching in the archives? And it's a wide, wide variety. And these are just a sampler of requests we've gotten in the last month and a half. So we have people who've been doing land boundary research and that's from boundaries dating back to 1792. We've had judgment in an 1857 court case, which was the sort of the precursor to um, child custody. There was a transcript that was copied um, in 1777. It was copied about 100 years later, related to Fort Ticonderoga, describing sort of the pit pitiful conditions that soldiers were facing there. Uh, people doing railroad valuation research and plenty of people doing far more recent research in legislative history and legislative tracing. What is the legislation now? What did it used to look like? And we've had somebody kind of doing some exciting research in their home. It was built in 1800 and they're researching the history of it from the land to the house building and who lived there. The types of researchers we have at Vasara range a lot and I'm just genealogy and personal research, whatever that nature of research is, is our primary research. Um, we have plenty of people doing legal research, and that's in legislative as well as Supreme Court briefs or previous case history documents that they can study, um, entry orders. And agency users are other state government employees doing research either in archival records or long-term storage of their own records that are stored here. We have scholars, um, so that's students, and I consider scholars from our National History Day sixth graders up through PhDs working on major projects and initiatives. Special projects can run the gamut. Um, in pre-COVID, we had some pretty exciting ones and people working on books or novels. And then I just make sure, you know, a little nudge here, you could put your project here. We would love to assist you. Um, references keeping on my feet and learning things every day. And that's really what I love about what I do. So this is just sort of the sample page. Um, so many people tell me that records are boring or the government records are boring. And it's just not. Um, these are three things that are straight from our holdings. Um, Calvin Coolidge gave his Vermont is a state that I love. Um, that speech was given in 1928, just a year after the devastating floods that managed to get um, Vermont pretty well flattened for a time. Um, he always said that um, the brave little state moniker comes from this and says, I love Vermont because of her hills and valleys, her scenery and invigorating climate, but most of all because of her inominable people. They're a race of pioneers who have been beggared themselves to serve others. And a spirit of liberty should vanish in other parts of the union in support of our institution and language. It could all be replenished from the generous store held by the people of this brave little state of Vermont. The document you're seeing in the middle is probably one of the more tragic pieces here, but it's just so powerful. May Evelyn LaBelle was murdered um, in June 1911, and this is her dying statement that they used to convict Arthur Bosworth of her murder. This is a government record. It is part of an investigation, and it is so very powerful. And then on the right, um, Vermont no longer does executions uh, at the state level, but this was an entry ticket for the execution of Edwin C. Hayden uh, in 1881. He murdered his wife. So government records to me are so much more than boring. And I'm going to share with you some of my very favorite pieces. This is just the tip of the iceberg of what you could find here. And my biggest argument for using archival records, especially Vermont state ones, they're not used as much as they could be. And they have some treasures that are just waiting to be found because somebody's treasure um, is waiting to be uncovered. It might not be a treasure to anyone else until somebody tells us it is. 
So I'm going to start with the Vermont Constitution. Um, it was written in 1777, and it originally had a preamble, but that preamble was removed um, in the 1793 when we sort of rehashed it. It was written by Ira Allen, and it was very much his own personal rant against New York, New Hampshire, and Great Britain for all of the fuss going on um, with sort of trying to not only make the colonies at heel, but he was pretty ticked off that they were trying to get, um, New York was trying to force Vermont to be under its jurisdiction. It was largely drawn from Pennsylvania's 1776 constitution, but went a few steps further. It prohibited um, adult slavery and it had universal manhood suffrage. So the stylistic writing at the top, and I think a lot of people are, have seen this before, it's on vellum and it's been preserved um, it's pretty good. You can read it very well. Um, it gave birth to the state uh, and it basically, Vermont's founding documents had radical innovations, but what's interesting about how Vermont's constitution worked is that it had a mechanism called the Council of Censors that would propose amendments to the constitution if needed, and that was every seven years. They were proposed several that were adapted in 1786 constitution and um, really uh, sort of set the foundation. So um, amendments to the Constitution aren't very frequent, but there are a few that might be up for approval by voters this year. Uh, the remarkable thing about the Constitution documents is you're seeing just the front page. There's 16 pages of the 1777 uh, Constitution, and then there's also pages and pages of every time it was amended, additions were made, um, and sometimes some of the debate in the journals by the General Assembly and its um, predecessor to the Senate called the Governor and Council. I mean, it's our constitution. And I think sometimes like you can have this idea of a piece of paper, but when you get to touch it and you see that this is a founding document that has so much history attached to it, I find that it's just a powerful piece of, of history that is just right here and waiting for you. Sometimes, documents and treasures have a very circuitous route coming back to us. This is just a letter, um, I mean, the, George Washington's letter, and this is a, an article explaining how Vermont got it back. Um, essentially, um, we have two George Washington letters in the Vermont State Archives holding. This one that I'm talking about today is by far the more famous of the two. Um, the letter was purchased and donated to the state in 1984, and unlike some things that don't tend to have a monetary value, it was sold at auction at Christie's for $14,300 in 1984. This is a four-page letter. It's one where George Washington wrote himself instead of having a secretary doing the writing. We let people look at this letter. Um, it is interesting because as early as 1779, the United States Congress tried to issue a series of resolutions concerning Vermont and wanted um, and what would be required Vermont to join the Union. Uh, there was a big debate going on and it got more and more heated and George Washington feared that Congress would order troops into Vermont. Um, and this uh, 1783 letter is just personally a favorite because he, he's telling his friend, Representative Joseph Jones, that um, just the prospects of federal troops invading an independent republic was not a good idea. They were seeking to join the United States. It might take a while to have us join, but you just shouldn't mess with that, I guess is the easiest term. Um, Vermont didn't want to join on the terms of the federal Congress. And um, there was a whole array of Vermont officials arresting and confiscating property of individuals that would were claiming allegiance to New York, and they were trying to sort of forcefully assert authority. The most famous little 
uh, quotation in here says, George Washington says about Vermonters that the country is very mountainous, full of defiles and extremely strong. The inhabitants for the most part are a hardy race composed of that kind of people who are best calculated for soldiers. In truth, who are soldiers? There are many, many hundreds of them are, are deserters from this army who having acquired property there would be desperate in defense of it, well knowing that they were fighting with halters the about their necks. So even George Washington was just like, it wasn't worth a fight. Um, Vermonters have a, I think just like the brave little state, we have a concept and view of ourselves as pretty hardy, but hey, George Washington agreed. Well, what happens? Um, I think many people know that eventually Vermont did decide that we would join the union and that we became the 14th state, the 14th star on March 4, 1791. Well, since we knew this was going to happen, um, the Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, the federal government, sent a copy of the Bill of Rights. Um, it originally had 12 proposed amendments, but only 10 passed. The amendments were um, that was on compensation of members of Congress was actually finally ratified in 1992. Uh, Vermont ratified it in 1791. So as I said, Vermont joined the Union March 4th, 1791. Um, so birthday just passed. It was the 10th state at the time to join to ratify the Bill of Rights to the Constitution. And it wouldn't become law until Virginia ratified it on December 15, 1791, uh, a month later. This has Thomas Jefferson's signature, and I kind of squeal every time I see it. I can't help it. I've been FSR long enough, but I, about a decade, and I still love seeing this particular document anytime we bring it out. It's also been restored. Um, there have been some staining damage on it, but it is the sort of cover sheet attesting to it, authenticity, and then it includes those first 12 proposed amendments. So sometimes the treasure, or what I would call a treasure, doesn't look like much until you open it up and realize what it says. Um, Vermont it did something called the Court of Confiscation. This was authorized by the governor and council in 1778, there had been one in each county and seven men were essentially appointed to confiscate the estates of British sympathizers, Tories, loyalists. Um, and then the confiscated land would be sold to benefit the treasury. I am opening to just one page. It looks relatively innocent. It is just page 18 from January, 1779. In this particular document is pretty remarkable. The idea of confiscating land of Tories came by uh, Ira Allen, Ethan Allen's brother, and he'd been the one to suggest this plan. And this page is um, a volume documenting proceedings when Ethan Allen accused their younger brother, Levi, of having Tory sympathies. And so they had Levi's property seized. So Levi had gone to Long Island to help free Ethan when he was imprisoned there a few years earlier. And at the time, he sort of made some connections to get Levi um, would sell uh, to the British. And the proceedings then in 1779 took his property and he was imprisoned for six months. When Levi was let out, he turned firmly to the British side and ended up first in Florida. When Florida was sold to Spain by the British, um, he came back to Vermont. He challenged his brother Ethan to a duel, which was not accepted. And eventually he was convinced to put his resentment behind him and be welcomed back in the family. So I guess that's one thing. Um, family squabbles and other times is not quite as historic, but uh, some epic family fights here, a real true family feud. Levi eventually participated in some of these secret negotiations to potentially make Vermont a British province. But of course that went to nothing because we did in fact join the union. Levi died in Burlington's debtor's prison in 1801 and he is buried in an unmarked grave on the prison grounds. 
but you'll see there's nothing, I guess, that looks fancy about this, but it's still a remarkable document and it's just waiting for people to take a look. So there's some treasures abounding. I'm going to share two from a set of records called the Manuscript Vermont State Papers. These are records of Vermont government. They date mainly from 1760 to 1860, but it sometimes goes even later than that, as late as the 1950s. It was the original core of the state archives, and it includes an abundance of records from petitions to the legislature, pardons, um, other sorts of petitions of like just um, to governors, grand lists, correspondence, resolutions, committee reports, court confiscation documents, mostly financial depositions, and I even once found a set of justice of the peace records where um, somebody was suing their friend for the theft of a deck of playing cards. Um, it is a, there is a name and subject index to the papers and the pre 18th century index is online. So the pre 1800s, excuse me. Uh, this is the landing page. It's at um, our web page and it's just the Nye index if you're looking for it. Um, you can search uh, by personal, like a keyword or by name or by date or by description. I recommend keyword. So we can see Alan Ira to search by last name, first name, and you can expand your results. This, the, the second half of the index, which is dates from mostly 1800 to 1860s is not online. It's only available in our reference room. And it is a very, very underused record set. And because of that, I'm sharing two documents I found there. This is a letter from the famous Secretary of State, Daniel Webster. Um, this is actually part of a whole other piece of, of cool Vermont history. Um, Christian Meadows was a skilled engraver and he'd been a pretty respectable citizen, but he got roped into counterfeiting in 1849 um, under the leadership of somebody who called himself Bristol Bill. And that story was all over the news for a couple of years because they'd gone to um, Groton, Vermont, thinking that, well, you know, they can't catch us in Boston. They can't catch us in other big cities. Well, they're not going to catch us here. Well, they did. Um, Christian Meadows was a model prisoner and was also repentant. And so he had worked on some engraving and wanted to get back to good citizenship. Daniel Webster had seen some of his engravings and had written to the governor uh, at the time, that's Charles Williams, to pardon Meadows um, so he could use his talents engraving maps for the federal government. Well, Governor Williams declined, and but eventually Erastus Fairbanks issued a pardon and Meadows was freed. Um, and he did live in Windsor for a little while, but eventually he sort of disappeared into Canada and was not heard from. So we don't even know what happened to Christian Meadows. The whole set of records related to Christian Meadows, uh, Bristol Bill, and sort of the adventures of their, um, their time counterfeiting is something I felt should be a movie. So if anybody out there would like to research them and, and start writing that screenplay, I have some suggestions for you. So Hiram Turner is not a famous scholar or a famous statesman. He is just a person writing in 1867. He was very not impressed with his neighbor. I mean, we're talking in the time of war. Uh, somebody had put up the uh, Confederate battle flag, and he wrote that he was offering the governor to I would cordially tender my services to take that or any other flag of that character down with its possessor also. And of course, he signed it your obedient servant, as was the norm at the time. Um, this is a regular East Randolph Vermonter giving his opinion to the governor. People still do that today, not quite as beautifully written, um, but they write to their governor for all sorts of reasons, and those correspondence are just as valid. This one just cracks me up. The Surveyor General's Papers is a set of records that I would say, given sort of the nature of getting them back because they had been sold and were repurchased at this most part in 1919. 
Um, the records date from 1779 to 1838, and they show gorgeous uh, surveys and plans done by Ira Allen, James Whitelaw, Samuel Kraft, and Evan Judd. They're absolutely stunning documents. The index is readily available as a PDF form online, but it takes a little bit of challenge to use. Um, but every time I look at them, I'm just blown away by the artistry of early surveyors. I mean, we're talking importance of laying out Vermont landscape, but when you look at these things, it's just stunning. It's just beautiful. Now, uh, after saying that, I'm going to share something that's not really beautiful, but it just cracks me up. I'm, I, I have a bit of a sense of humor. And Eben Judd was one of these surveyors. Um, he was a legendary um, figure in Essex County. He was a statesman, land agent, farmer, merchant, a mill operator. I think he also published almanacs and compiled and invented and surveyed. And he surveyed much of Essex County. Um, many researchers use the surveyor general records for what they're intended to take a look at the town, how towns and roads were laid out um, in the early part of Vermont history. But this one is seeing this famous man at age 25, um, his personal journal as he was going through and surveying. Um, it it has the reflections of a young man with some kind of comedic timing. It says he went to a Thanksgiving Day dance. Um, it was Thanksgiving Day in the state of Vermont. Went to Mr. Hall's at night and was entertained with a fine supper of roasted turkey, chicken pies, and apple pies. The first apple pie or apple I have tasted at Coos. We had a fiddler and a Coos dance and went thence to Mrs. Mr. Lucy's about 10 o'clock at night where we found a company drinking scalded rum or hot toddy as they called it. We had a high caper as it is usually called. About midnight, we returned to Esquire Eames and made out to get to bed without help. So anybody who's probably experienced um, some slight tipsiness, um, I thought, I feel like I could talk to Evan Judd. I, I get where he's coming from. And his whole journal um, was edited by D. Gregory Sanford for a Vermont history article. Um, I just love some of his plain thoughts on life. Another treasure we have here is the um, New York Inferior Court of Common Pleas. It was created under British rule and the jurisdiction of the province of New York. And these records range from 1770 to 1774. So all of the cases are going to be, instead of the people or the state of Vermont, it's going to be the crown versus the defendant in a criminal matter. The county seat was chosen as the unsettled town of Kinsland, which is now the town of Washington. And that seat was eventually moved to Newberry in 1771. It was a much broader swatch of land than the current county setup. I, again, maybe you're seeing here in a time of being home and cooped up a lot, I've looked for humor. Um, how many of you out there, I'm sure, can talk about how much you hate the Vermont roads, uh, mud season, all of that? Well, let me tell you a lot. This is a 1774, and in it, it says um, that they traveled until, until night, there being no road and the snow very deep. We traveled on snowshoes. We traveled some ways and held a council. When it was concluded, it was best to open the court at we saw, not it was whether in Kingsland or not, but we concluded we were far in the woods. All cases continued or adjourned over the next turn to court if one adjourned over until the last Tuesday in May next. So they didn't know where they were, so they weren't sure if they were actually in the, the king's land. And this is part of the problem of settling and having a jurisdiction where there's no settlers. There wasn't any place, so they couldn't say where they were, but they could say that the roads were very bad. Um, other items that are found in this early set of records includes um, just some very basic topics. Um, Debt cases, tavern license, um, assaults by individuals uh, against others, mostly barroom probably, and then appointments of officers to see the needs of the developing area 
uh, especially road construction, which is, <laughs> makes sense. Um, there was one interesting case where Rebecca Martin had what was considered an early kind of child custody case against somebody called Hezekiah Silloway. Um, and at the time, uh, he was cleared on the charges because of the timing of the child's birth. And then Rebecca is brought up on charges of what was called whoredom in the next term. Historic court records are one of those things where I could just go on at length about, and I have. Um, I've given that talk before. I'm always happy to point people in the direction of some of the untapped treasures um, of, of historic documents for court record research. Probate court records. I think a lot of people think um, even just something this mundane can't be a treasure, but um, the probate would do wills and settlements of estates, but it also did adoptions, guardianships, name changes, later the correction of vital records, civil commitments to um, the state hospital, um, and also people committed in other instances, and then insolvency um, up until the United States took over bankruptcy in the 1890s. So for example, what the kind of treasure you find. I mean, I think a lot of people are familiar with the Morgan horse. Um, and I just kind of, we came across this. Um, Justin Morgan the of Figaro fame died in Randolph in 1798. He was impoverished at the time. So his estate was insolvent and they were doing an inventory to see what they could sell for his creditors to pay off his debts. Um, he's best known as the owner of Figure, but at the time, um, he was better known as a composer and a musician uh, of church music, mostly a hymn. Um, and you can see in the estate inventory that there's no horses uh, anymore at his property, but they do mention tack, saddlebags, and other riding equipment. Um, so are books, medical opium, and one of the things about inventorying, um, about one in four Vermonters had an estate that went through the probate court process, whether they had enough property that had to go through um, a court mediation or if they were insolvent and somebody had to sit down and figure out who was going to be paid and how they were going to maintain any widows or children. Um, but people who find their own ancestors find treasures. And you might not think that that's true, but for many it is. You can find some remarkable things, like even down to what sort of books they were reading. Newspapers. The entire microfilm collection from the State Library is now in the State Archives and includes most Vermont titles. And the microfilm collection spans from late 1700s to the present day. And nearly all the papers are available online through newspapers.com. Um, access. Newspapers are fill in the blanks for what the public record just simply doesn't have, whether the records don't exist because fires or floods or lack of keeping something. Newspapers recorded all sorts of things from day to day life or what was historic happening in the town or location at the time. So newspapers.com portal is available free to Vermont residents. Um, there is access through our webpage that points you on how to, to get access to these records. There's some very interesting things you find in newspapers. And my most exciting is the obituary of Lucy Terry Prince. Uh, there are so much um, people whose lives aren't well documented in the government record. But this is um, the obituary of Lucy Terry Prince. She was stolen from Africa as a baby um, around 1730. She was sold into slavery in Rhode Island, and she married uh, Abijah Prince, who bought her freedom in 1756. The family moved to Guilford in 1764, and she died in Sunderland in 1821. Um, She's remembered for her ballad Bar Fights. It was a 1746 incident that she um, was writing about, um, and it was preserved orally until it was published in 1855. Uh, it is considered one of the oldest known works of literature by an African American. And she was also known to have argued before the Vermont Supreme Court against racial sabotage of, that her neighbors were trying uh, on their property. 
she had a really remarkable life and there's not much in the state archives about her but this obituary gives her just how remarkable she was in a time where people didn't think she could do the thing she could uh, if possible, she's well worth researching further and reading some more about her. The Great Seal of Vermont. Um, there are documents in, a, in this series of, of records that document the, say, the seal. It was designed by Ira Allen in 1778, but a new seal was created in 1821 and variations of it were used um, until 1937 which is when they decided to return to the original version and the legislature had a counter created by Tiffany and company uh, cast in 1937. And I think um, the purpose of a seal from the historic day to now is to mark a document as official. And so you can see the seal uh, as the impression that it has document documenting things that are important to Vermonters from a cow, a pine tree, which makes Vermont, you know, the green mountains, um, sheaves of wheat for the agriculture economy. And then of course, prime place, Vermont's motto, freedom and unity. On the left, you can see the proclamation when they ordained the great seal. Um, and you can see the impression in gold, how it looks. I mean, it just looks so small and this die was done in 37, but I love holding it. It just, there's just something about the weightiness of history. When you see something that was re-envisioned from the original in the 1770s and brought back in 1937 and is still what we use to, as the seal of Vermont today. Photographs um, in Archival holdings are very rich, but they're very hard to find what you need. Unfortunately, indexing wasn't all that well done. Um, Edwin T. Houston's photographs from his studio are in the state archives and they are well indexed. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those. He was based in Montpelier from 1920 to 1942, and um, the studio continued kind of under new ownership for a while after that. And he took many photographs of government buildings, officials, legislators, and then views in and around Montpelier as the um, state capital. That included a photograph of Amelia Earhart. Um, so this photo is, um, she visited Vermont in March, 1935. Uh, it was a really exciting visit for Vermont. She visited before sort of in passing because she had friends here, but she was giving a speech to the legislature in support of aviation. That speech is published in the journal for the time in the Senate journal. Um, and she also had spoken to cadets at the Norwich University. Her friend was the president, Porter Adams. And this photograph has been a popular one. I mean, she disappeared just two years later. And you can see there's all sorts of people crowded around to see her from the dignitaries to school children. And it's a somewhat large photograph. How do you really put the, the price on something that has completely disappeared? Um, as a treasure goes, you could maybe, even though it's black and white, walk off and look right into this. Um, I think it's flipped, but this photograph was taken of Wrightsville uh, in 1933. And Wrightsville is a town that doesn't exist anymore. Um, the 1927 floods forced um, sort of some reevaluation and the needs to build reservoirs to to keep that flooding from happening. The Civil Affiliate and Conservation Corps, the CCC, built the Wrightsville Dam from 1933 to 35, and that required disbanding and flooding the village. And so they took pictures uh, of the village before it was inundated. And you can see like, it just looks like a town, but it doesn't exist anymore. And eventually um, they had to move even the bodies out of from the cemetery and move them to Middlesex. This is just a photograph of Sheldon um, from 1914, a hand-colored slide. 
And I have shown you um, photos and items and stories that I consider treasures of the Vermont State Archives. But archival records are meant to be of enduring value and state public records are held in the name of the people of the state of Vermont. These are your records. They're part of your story. As an archivist, I feel privileged to know that the records and then I know some of the stories that come with them. Um, I'm happy to share the stories and the documents with researchers. These that I've selected document famous people, Vermont history, some humor. Um, and whenever though I help someone uncover a piece of their own family history or a new understanding about Vermont history, I consider those connections to be just as valuable and just as much a treasure. When I look at this kind of image, I feel like I could walk off onto that dirt road into Sheldon of 1914. An archive like ours is so much more than the stereotypical of a hidden away place or something that isn't relevant today. History in these documents comes to life with sort of humor, solemnity, feuds, beauty of Vermont. And so it documents what happens in the state archives. I so very, very wish I could have this conversation live and take your questions, um, but I very much appreciate your time. So if you have questions, you can contact the reference room at 802-828-2308. We respond within one business day. Um, the, our email is sosarchives at vermont.gov for your reference queries. And then you can email me personally at marisa.dobrik at vermont.gov. Our reference room is open by appointment from nine to four, and we have a Twitter handle. Eventually, we look forward to being open again without appointment and to assist people far more. Um, we very much appreciate having visitors and would love to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marissa, for a wonderful presentation. Next month, we are really excited to bring you Dr. Jess Robinson. He is the Vermont State Archaeologist and a Professor of Anthropology at the University of Vermont, and he is going to present on some of the latest findings about the early woodlands period here in Vermont. We look forward to seeing you then. And as always, if you enjoyed this presentation and would like to support the Ethan Allen Homestead, please go to the donation link in the description box below or on our website, ethanallenhomestead.org. Thank you very much and we'll see you next month.